Marketing and promotion is the lifeblood of your business. Have you tried Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and have no clue why you're not getting leads, followers, or any traction? Have you worked with other agencies and then nothing happened? 10X Productions, Grant Cardone's digital advertising agency, is now available for you to get on track with social media lead generation, full-scale training, and production. We'll get you the leads and give you the training to understand your social media and how to build a brand better. Just go to CardoneAdvertising.com. That's CardoneAdvertising.com to get your free marketing assessment and we will get you on the road to the right marketing and all of your business needs. Visit Cardone Advertising right now. Hey, welcome to Power Players. I, I'm so excited today. You know, we, every Tuesday, we, we, our goal is to bring you somebody in power that's had the experience of doing something extraordinary. And today I have a guy that I've been following for a long time, Ryan Serhant. Not his original name, but we'll go into that in a little bit. He's asked me not to, but I have to because I'm just fascinated with it. And he's just written a book, Sell It Like Ryan, right? Yeah, Sell It Like Serhant, yep. Yeah, Sell It Like Serhant. And uh, you're on the TV show, Million Dollar Listing, New York. In case and, you guys aren't watching it. Yeah, and set like Sir Hand on Bravo. Appreciate you being here. Thanks. Okay, yeah. great to have you. You've sold how much in real estate? What do, you, oh. what do you think you're responsible for? Total? I don't know. We did just over $830 million last year. Wow. The, the year before, I think we did something like 6 40 or something like that. Uh -huh. The year before, it was 500 something. I so big, big increases. Years ago. Yeah. 10 years and almost doing a billion dollars a year. Yeah, yeah. Brokering. Yeah, brokering. Very yeah, different from so what does that mean? So, yeah, what does that mean? So the audience understands brokering. So we're real estate brokers. So residential real estate brokers, and we take commissions on everything that we sell. So you know that eight hundred thirty-eight is made up of a lot of million-dollar deals, two million-dollar deals. You know, a handful of twenty, thirty, and forty million-dollar deals. And so that's the gross sales number. I think gross commission last year was like twenty-one or twenty-two million. That's awesome. Yeah. That's all, and that's why you're sitting in that chair, man. Right. So how does a guy, okay, before we go back to, you know, how you became who you are today, sure. how does a guy step into a business that's extremely competitive? Yep. Uh, because most of the audience is watching this, they're in the same space. And sure. may, maybe not real estate, but it's competitive. How does a guy 10 years ago step into New York real estate business, yeah. highly competitive, and produce at these kind of levels in, in that short a period of time? I mean, the barrier of entry for sales is like down in the floor. Yeah. Like that's what's so great about it. That's also what's so scary about it. But if it wasn't so easy to get into the business, I never would have gotten into it. If in order to become a salesperson or become a real estate broker, if I had to go to school for four years and take on a lot of debt, I probably wouldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. But it was, I think at the time, 50 or 60 hours in a class, a couple hundred bucks, and you become a licensed associate salesperson in New York City. And you could advise people on a billion dollar deals. If you could find somebody that wants to do that, yeah. if you know what you're talking about. So you start from the bottom. You know, there's 80,000 of us, I think, in the city now. Just in New York. Yeah, it's it, there's a lot. Wow. Um, and you start at the bottom. So you do rentals, right? And I got into the business purely just to pay my own rent. Mm -hmm. That's the whole reason I did it was because I, I didn't want to be a bartender. I didn't want to be a waiter. I wanted to make my own hours, not be stuck to a desk. And so I'd post ads on Craigslist. I'd meet people and then I'd go show them other apartments and hopefully they'd take one. And that was my that was my sales boot camp was meeting crazy New Yorkers on the street and showing them apartments that I didn't know where they were. And I learned the city at the same time because I'm not from New York. I didn't know anybody. Um, and those are my first clients and just sort of built up and built up and built up from there. So your first deal was what? Do you remember? Uh, it was, yeah, it was, it was a like lease? A, yeah, it was eleven hundred dollars a month. Oh, they were all leases. Uh -huh. All my first deals for the first couple of years were 
we're 1100 bucks a month in Koreatown, right? And so that's $1,100 a month. The commission would be one month's rent. I would split it 50-50 with the house. So I would be $550. Like, yeah, 550 bucks, which for me at the time was like models and bottle money, right? Yeah, it was, yeah, it yeah. was huge. Yeah. Because I had spent the first couple of years in the city making no money whatsoever. You and can get just, a model for 550 bucks? I thought so at the time. I didn't know that. Yeah, I thought so at the time. Um, but any amount of money that I could make in that, you know, in 2008, 2009 uh-huh. was a lot of money to me Yeah, because I, I, I credit a lot of that to my success today that I, I had no other understanding of money, mm-hmm. no other, other understanding of wealth or bills or responsibility. Like every couple hundred bucks I made meant a shitload to me. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And so every time I would compound that and compound that and compound that, I just wanted more and more and more. And it was just a matter of my time. So just how much time was I willing to put in? How much time was I willing to not take off? And then I could pass everybody else just purely by working harder. So who were you before this and before a million dollar listing? Like, t- tell me about how you grew up, where you grew up and what the circumstances like. Uh, I was born in Texas in Houston. Okay. Grew up where, what part in of Texas, Houston? Kingswood. Okay. Yeah, yeah. outside of Texas. Houston. Yeah. Um, grew up there and moved to Long Island for a little bit and then really moved out to outside Boston. So I grew up outside Boston. Go Red Sox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so they just won. Um, I grew up outside Boston and I did like English and theater were my things, mm-hmm. right? And I went to college in upstate New York and I wanted to do theater. That was always kind of what my passion was, what I wanted to do, I wanted to be an actor. And that's what brought me to New York City when I graduated. I took the LSAT because I thought I had to go to law school like every other liberal arts you know, graduate uh-huh. and I bombed that. So that didn't work out. And then I, I tried to be an actor, could make no money. It didn't work out. I got into a soap opera for a short period of time and then I got killed off. Yeah. And then I ran out of money. I was like, what do I do? Do I move home to Colorado? Cause my parents had moved by then. Or do I stay in New York and try to figure it out? And that's when a friend said, listen, get your real estate license, rent apartments. It'll at least buy you time. And my rent was like a thousand bucks a month, you know, for a studio on 31st street in Broadway. Uh, sharing a bathroom with a lot of people and it was the worst, but it kept me in New York City and that's what I did. So when did you lose the Texas accent? I never really had one because no. my, my parents aren't from Texas, okay. but we live there. My my sisters who are still there, they have accents, uh-huh. but I never really had one. And it's because then we went to Long Island where there's a strong accent and then we went to Boston where there's a strong accent. So I think that the accents never really stuck to me. Yeah, and you went with who? When, when you went- With move. my parents, okay. my parents and my little brother. And why were they going there? Uh, for work. Okay. And for my dad's job, which bounced around a little bit. And he was doing what? Finance. My whole family does finance, every single one of them. But what does that mean, finance? They're all they're all in investment banking. Okay. Yeah. They make a lot of money in that space? I think so. Yeah, they do okay. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you mean you think so? You. I mean, I, mean, I had a comfortable life. Yeah, like, yeah. that's what I'm looking squalor. for. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, yeah. you grew up middle class, yeah. upper middle class. Yeah, we grew up nice. We had nice houses. I had nice things. I never had to deal with student debt, you mm-hmm. know? Like, we grew up well. Um, and so I think that, but we always had to work. Like my little brother and I always had to do manual labor for our jobs. It sucked. It was the worst. Uh-huh. I, I resented it, you know, full, fully. Um, but I also credit it at the same time, you know, now. Like I'm very, very thankful that I had to work in construction and do roofs for years and years and years because I never want to do that again. And I will work my ass off every day to keep me off of roofs. So did your dad instill this, hey, you got to work? Yes, 100%. That came from him or yes. your mom? No, my dad, uh-huh. for sure. And what was he telling you as a kid? Um, that's, you know, there's a lot of things you can't control, but how hard you work isn't one of them. Oh, wow. And like that. that, you know, everybody else can be taller, bigger, smarter, faster, come from uh-huh. different families, come with money, go to better schools, but you can always show up earlier. You can always show up later. So like when I first got to New York and I wanted to be an actor, I lived with two guys, two roommates. One was, uh, they were both paralegals because they both wanted to be lawyers. And my dad told me, and I remember, he's like, listen, you don't have a job. You don't have any boss telling you what to do. They do. You're going to wake up before they do and go to bed after they do. You're going to work harder than they do. And that's at least how you're going to know whether this is going to work or not. Because mm-hmm. the last thing you want to do is just show up and wait for the phone to ring. And that really kind of rang true to me. And he also taught me that everything that I do is a choice. So the waking up, the working out, the making the calls, the doing the follow up, the emails, like picking yourself up after you get knocked down, like it's all a choice that you make. And that mm-hmm. makes this job very, very freeing versus kind of being as depressing as it can be for a lot of people. You, you mean the job now, the, yeah, the, the real estate. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when did you, when you took the, uh, when you went to acting and yeah. then said, hey, this isn't gonna work out. Yeah. Was it because of the money, the opportunity? The or- money, for sure. It's the money, but also the happiness. Like there's, 
there's a correlation between the two. Like I, I wish upon no one to be dead broke in New York City. Yeah, yeah. Like it's it's terrifying. Like there's a lot knowing, of people that are dead broke yeah, in New York listen, City. Listen, right? and not knowing how you're going to pay your bills that month, not knowing like what am I going to do if I don't hit rent? You know, getting your credit card declined, like all that stuff was very, very humbling for me. Uh -huh. uh, and I'm glad it happened to me when I was really young, right? When I was 22, 23. But at the same time, it really teaches you that no matter what your passion is, your passion also has to be able to pay the bills. So I wanted mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. an actor, but I also wasn't willing to be homeless for it. And I didn't want to move home and make some money and because I never would come back, right? That's the thing. Like once I got to New York, I knew I had to figure out a way to stay there because I never would come back. Um, and so that was a big deal for me. So you, how do you make the transition from actor, starving actor, yeah. to, to getting shot on a soap? Yeah. How were you killed off in the soap? I, I kind of slightly killed myself with a syringe to the chest oh, waiting wow. on the top of a hospital. I think it's on YouTube if you YouTube Ryan Serhan and As the World Turns. I was uh -huh. waiting on the hospital because I played Dr. Evan Walsh the fourth, And I was waiting for a helicopter to take me to the Caribbean where I could do my research in peace. Yeah, that's how I went. And, and, and so it was suicide. Yeah, well, sort of. It was me like uh, uh, fighting with my grandmother and she kind of wrestled and the uh, syringe went into my chest and it was like, oh, and I died. So when you were doing that, dude, what, yeah. what were you thinking? Like doing that? My so life's far? over. Well, what, no, when no. The, like, when the like, soap started? It, yeah, yeah. Like, like I made it. Like, really? Huh? Yeah, man. Like you. What like, were they paying you for that soap at that time? $844 an episode. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so that was, that was big, right? And then I had to learn about taxes and what taxes are yes. and what FICA is. Yeah. And then I remember calling my dad being like, what happened to all my money? Where'd my money go? Yeah. I, where's, my, where's my check? And he's he was like, like, grow up, son. Yeah, and he's like, this is what I was angry about all the time. And I'm like, oh, wow. now I get it. So sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, you know, that, was a, that was an adult moment for me for sure. Um, but when I was on the soap, like that's, because I've been doing free theater. Like I played mm -hmm. a clock, like I did stuff like in Union Square, you know, like you do everything you can. You stand in line for 20 hours just to be seen for an audition and you're dead tired and then they close the door. Like yeah. it's, it's very, 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 um, it's, it's not rewarding. Yeah, so what time. do you say, because that reminds me of the real estate agent that, com that complains about the open house. Yeah. I had to sit here all day and wait. Yeah. And then you described the acting, because my yeah. wife's an actor. Yeah. So I understand, like, she waits in an audition. Yeah. You know, for, for a, supposedly her mock-up. Yeah, sure. And then they decide on somebody completely different. Yeah. Shorter, taller, whatever, right? So how do you how do you tell a real estate agent that's complaining about the open house about the 20 hour standing in line for a maybe part? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's all a numbers game, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a big thing for me. Like, how do you have as many balls in the air as possible? So it's okay when certain ones drop because mm -hmm. they just will by default. And that's what the whole book is about. And that's kind of how I built my, my real estate business because, you know, in the acting business, like you don't get that part because of your face, right? Mm -hmm. And because you're prematurely gray or whatever the issue might be, or because you suck reading the lines. Right. In, real estate, the one thing I loved immediately, which other people really hate, is that the rejection was never because of my face. Mm. Like someone didn't take an apartment because I was too tall. Right, right. I, they, they didn't take it because they didn't want it or right, because right. they suck. I don't know. Uh -huh. And so I never took it personally. And so it was always just that numbers game. It was about whether it was the right product yeah, or the right yeah. pricing. Or which was which was awesome for me. Uh -huh. And I think those two years trying to act and having uh, being rejected over and over and over so personally is what built up that thick skin in me so that where like the 84% of real estate agents who quit in New York City in their first year wow. because they can't handle that rejection. For me, I didn't have that. I got rejected all the time, don't uh -huh. get me wrong. Like I, in my mind, I was quitting all the time because it just was brutal, but it wasn't because of my ears. <laughs> like it wasn't because right, of the right. way I looked on camera. Uh -huh. It was because this of- This was something you could control yeah, finally. Yeah, I mean, in a, in a way, right? There's a lot of stuff in real estate you can't control either. Yeah. Like bankers, attorneys, what the mother-in-law is gonna say, what the wife says when she walks in and mm -hmm. she doesn't like the paint color. Like that stuff you can't control, but at least I can anticipate it and work with it. Whereas in the acting business, it was completely out of my control. But in that time, you know, in waiting in those lines and you wait and wait and wait and wait and wait, I tried to be as resourceful as possible. So I would try to meet all the other actors in line, right? And I'd try to make other friends. Maybe there's other things that I could do with that time and with those relationships more than just waiting for my turn. And same thing with open houses. Like I, you try to use that time as much as you can, whether it's calling other agents who have similar other open houses to see mm -hmm. how their traffic is, get mm -hmm. to know them. Mm -hmm. You do other work on your phone, you come prepared. And then, you know, if there are 50 people who show up, then you do that stuff afterwards. So how does this thing come 
full house for you? Like, I mean, what it seems like you you had this entrepreneur thing, yeah. Even as an actor, and then and then you get the entrepreneur thing handled a little bit in real estate, but you go back to the acting. I mean, it, it's like a full circle. Yeah, it's for you. weird. You're um, on TV all the time. Yeah, I think it's a lot of people say that to me, and they're like, "You have the best of both worlds," because you wanted to be on TV and. And then you weren't, and then you got into real estate, but now you're also on TV doing real estate. And I think it's like, uh, you know, what is that line? Um, you know, about luck. Like luck is when opportunity meets preparation. Yeah, yeah, right, right. right. Which you, like you never really believe until it actually happens. Yeah. Like I prepared my whole life to be in front of a camera, um, and I thought it was going to work one way, and it did not work that way. Mm -hmm. And then this opportunity came up when Million Dollar Listing Los Angeles decided to do a New York franchise in 2010. They put out a casting call and I saw it because it was in the real estate newspapers and I'd totally given up on acting two years prior. And I saw that and was like, wait a minute, I've, I was on a soap, man. I've done stuff before, I'll go yeah. to that. Yeah. And they were like, are you the greatest real estate agent under the age of 30? And I'm like, fuck yes I am. And just sold myself. That, that was the question. Huh? Yeah, basically. You did, know, you, did you do that in person or did you do it in over person Skype? At first? It was uh -huh. like a 30 second in person interview. Uh -huh. And then it was a bunch of emails and follow up. And it was like a six month audition process. Oh, wow. Um, but I knew how to handle myself in front of the camera. And now I actually did real estate. And so I think that helped whittle it down so that when they cast me on the show, then I just had to really step up to the plate of being mm -hmm. the greatest real estate agent ever. Yeah, and that yeah, really yeah, put a yeah. gun to my head to go out and make more phone calls, talk to more people on the street, follow up with more people, because the last thing I want to do is fail on television as a yeah, real estate yeah. broker. So you're, you're making that claim, I am the greatest yeah. real estate agent. That's my affirmation. I did it yeah, yeah. publicly to yeah, everyone yeah, in the yeah. world, and I also did it in my own head. Like, what's, yeah. who's to stop me? Like, no one will ever tell me to stop selling, uh -huh. right? No one will ever tell me that I sold too much. So if I wake up every single day and say I'm the greatest real estate broker ever, it might not be true today, but it will be true eventually. So how important is that affirmation? Like, like just talk about for Massively. you, yeah, yeah, what people are saying to themselves the every day. The power of positivity, the power of yes, mm -hmm. right? Say yes and figure it out later. Mm. Stay positive. And you know, I always kind of look at it like you're driving in a car, right? And there are two types of people. One person looks out the right window where it's sunny. The other person looks out the left window where it's cloudy. Mm -hmm. And you both made the same choice to look out a window. One just decides to see a different type of weather. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's always been like, okay, so it's my choice to wake up upset. Bad things can happen. It's okay yeah. to get pissed and they do, off, right? right? And yeah. it always happen yeah. and balls will always fall. Mm -hmm. But it is your choice to wake up positively or negatively. And so I've always just made the choice, even if I'm gritting it and I yeah, hate yeah, it, and I really yeah, yeah. want to be pissed off and I want people to comfort me and I want to feel bad. That's not a choice I'm willing to make because I know it's going to affect my day and mm -hmm. no one wants to buy anything from someone who's pissed off. Right? They want to buy something from someone who's enthusiastic because that's what you sell. You sell enthusiasm every day. And that enthusiasm and that positivity, like that, that has been a huge, huge boon for me. So... You said uh, the affirmation you made publicly. Yeah. You know, because I think a lot of people know that they need to be positive within themselves. But you said, hey, when I make that public sure. on, on the you know, millionaire listings yeah. and say, I am the greatest, yeah. what, what is the power of you publicizing your decisions? I mean, it's, it's the power of massive stress, uh -huh. right? And kind of, and I always do that to myself. Like I put, I put a, like a big roadblock up in front of me whether it's that I went on TV and said, I'm the greatest real estate broker ever, now I have to live up to it, yeah, right. or I just bought something I can't afford, mm -hmm. or I just expanded my team and I don't know how to handle it. It's always important for me to create my own challenges so that I can then figure it out and then get to the next place, right? Otherwise, I'm just stuck and okay with the status quo. So by doing that and making it really public, and I do that now with the vlog and putting it out there on YouTube, which is a totally different audience for me that I've never had, a much, much younger audience, um, it's a way for me to kind of hold myself accountable. Like otherwise, you can say whatever you want to yourself in the mirror or in the shower, but unless right. you put it out there and you hold yourself accountable and kind of maybe feel like the threat of embarrassment coming because you're not gonna hit your mark, like then, then what good is it? The public will hold you accountable. Oh, for sure. I left the World Series game, game three. I saw, I saw, I was like, I knew it was coming out here and I see these, all these images of your wife, yeah. the 10X hat, and you're like, who is this woman? And I see yeah. you next to her and I was like, oh, yeah. that's great. Yeah, 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 so I left at the 16th inning. Yeah. At the bottom of the 16th, it, it went 18. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I was on three hour clock, so I'm, it was 3.30 in the morning for me. And I told my wife, I said, let's go now, it's time. You know, yeah. She's like, but, you know, it's going to go longer and their TV's why and we're on TV. And I'm like, 
everybody's going to sleep, okay? Yeah. So whatever we came to get here, we got already. I said, I need to go home now. So many people ragged on me for leaving early. Like, Why'd you leave early? You're the 10X man. You can't leave early. I said, well, I did that night. Yeah. So, because, because do, so do you think that that has helped you multiply your business, being on TV, being out there, well, telling sure. the public who you are and what you're going to stand up for? Yeah, success begets success. Mm -hmm. People will only hire you based on what you're known for. So if mm. I'm not out there telling people over and over, whether it's on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or because I got really, really lucky on a national television show, yeah, yeah. then uh, no one's gonna know what I stand for, especially when you're in sales, whether you're selling anything, you're selling classes, you're selling tires, you're selling real estate. So it's always important for me to put out there over and over that I'm a salesperson, this is what I sell, because that way people will know it. Yeah, and a lot of real estate agents, they don't even use the word sales. like. Yeah, it's weird. I can be with them 40, 45 minutes and like never hear the word come out. I'm not a sale. They actually say, I'm yeah. not here to sell you. Right. Which is. But you've used that word over <coughs> and over today. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I will say though that the biggest mistake most salespeople make is actively trying to sell. Uh -huh. Like that's, that's like watching a pot, right? A watch pot never boils. And so it's important to not focus on the sale, 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 sale. But it's a different conversation. You know, I talk about sales all the time because that is what I do. Like mm -hmm. I'm not mm -hmm. romanticizing it. I'm just, I'm not a real estate, you know, vice president or a real estate expert or a real estate broker. Like I'm a salesperson. Yeah, that yeah. is how I make an income. Right. That is what my 1099 depicts. Did I sell something uh -huh. or did I not? Mm -hmm. And I think once you own that, then you will sell more and you will make more. So, and you say like, if I come, come look at a condo, what's the most expensive deal you've done? Oh man, I mean, we sell entire buildings. So this year, like, the most expensive single family. Yeah. Sold a three bedroom apartment for 31 million. Yeah. So when that person walked in, yeah. you have an image of him right now? Yeah, well, I, I found him in the place, so he was my buyer, but yeah. Okay, so you went and, and yeah. they didn't just walk in. Do you call him up and say, I got the place for you? Yeah, and his budget was like 10 to 20, so he spent a lot more wow, than he wanted that's to. that's very interesting. Right, but. <laughs> now, why like did you that. show him 31 if, if his budget was 10? Because I knew he said his budget was 10 to 20 um, yeah. because I saw he was searching online spread, for his own way. stuff. Yeah, uh, but I knew he could afford it, uh -huh. right? And I knew too that he, he had a certain taste and he had a certain style. And so I didn't just take him to something that was 40 million bucks. Yeah. I showed him other things. I definitely showed him all the things in his price range and I saw that he didn't like them. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to stay in a price point. And I said, listen, I've got one thing that's gonna knock your socks off. Yeah. And that's that wow moment, yeah. right? Yeah. Showed him something for 40 million bucks. And he was did, like- Did he know how much it was gonna be yeah, before I told he got him, there? Yeah, I told him this thing. I was like, listen, don't don't be pissed off. I'm gonna show it yeah, to you, yeah. it's 40. Yeah, yeah. And after he really liked it, he's like, this is crazy. This is crazy. Let me know when they can get it to 20. And I said, listen, it's never gonna get to 20. Yeah. What if I got it to you for like 30, 30 and all of a sudden, that's like a nine, ten million dollar discount. Real estate yeah, market's yeah, funky. Yeah. And in his head, he's like, "Move to maybe." Well, that's a really good deal versus getting something. You know, if lo looking at twenty, getting it for eighteen. Yeah. I take forty at thirty-one. Uh -huh. It's a relative discount, and everyone is a discount buyer, especially right now. Uh -huh. And so then we just worked on the deal, and it was just about the deal. So how important is it? Because you just hit on something on the numbers that I think sure. a lot of salespeople miss. Is when you took the guy, like he's he's trying to practicalize sure. his own clothes. Yes. And you did something that I find fascinating, okay? Which yeah. is, look, 20 to 18 sounds good. 40 to 31 Always. sounds even better. Yes. So so how often are you doing that with a buyer or, uh, or even a seller? It's, it's something, I call it the wow moment. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I put it in the book because it, it really works. It's the psychology of the deal. And it happened yeah. to me, that's how I learned about it, when yeah. someone sold me a pair of shoes that I didn't mm -hmm. think I could afford, but I was like, wow, these shoes are awesome. You know, and in that building, because I bought in a building that's very expensive on Park Avenue, you know, there, the $40 million apartment was, was mid-tier. Like wow. he saw too that people were spending, you know, 75 to $100 million just for an apartment. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like I showed him the most expensive thing, but I showed him what was the best deal that blew away everything else that he was seeing. And that was a wow moment. And I, I didn't push him. Mm -hmm. At that point, I was like, all right, now let's go back to what you were looking at. Yeah, right. And, and it was, listen, don't get me wrong. A $20 million apartment is really, really, really nice. But compared to what he had just saw, it wasn't as nice. It's crumbs. Yeah, it's it crumbs. wasn't as it's, nice. And listen, you do the same thing whether you're selling something a uh, hundred bucks yeah. versus 200 bucks. Yeah, so it's inventory. Let's talk about the inventory because I talk a lot about moving people in inventory. Don't stay on one thing. Sure. Move them around. How, how much of that? Always. I, dude, I love a good salesman. Always. God dang. I never get guys in here. I get I get guys that know how to run a business, have big businesses, make a lot of money, yeah. but nobody really ever understands selling. Yeah, the So I'm glad you did selling. this for real estate agents because yeah, yeah, no they need it, dude. Yes. 
Because yeah. most real estate agents, I said this before, most of them suck as salespeople. Yeah. You agree with that yeah, statement? Most of them, listen, most salespeople, the problem is, is like, think about an athlete, right? You were at the baseball game, right? Yeah. Like those guys train their entire life, off season, right, everything, right. right? They've got, they're training, training, practice, 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 so that they get that one time at bat to show them what's up. Mm-hmm. Salespeople, they, they go to school for a couple hours, maybe, and then all of a sudden they're salespeople and they're up at bat. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, there's, yeah. There's a there's a mental breakdown there. Like, yeah. why don't more salespeople actually do training? Yeah, and whether it's reading this book, reading your book, like doing the trainings to learn that there is like there's an athleticism to it. There's a skill, and it's not about like swindling people. It's not about taking. It's not about convincing. Selling is 100% just about assuring, mm-hmm. right? For me, mm-hmm. it's always I been about that, man. assuring somebody of the choice that they were going to make anyway, or of a choice that's better, they just didn't even know it existed. And uh-huh. that's the inventory uh-huh. conversation. Yeah. So that's showing people different things. So for that guy, he really, really, really wanted to be on Fifth Avenue. And mm-hmm. I know this is so relatively crazy because the world I live in is so whacked with regards to pricing and location, but it's someone really wants to be on one street. And I forced myself and him to go to a couple different streets. He mm-hmm. didn't want to. Mm-hmm. But once he saw what was on the other street and what the relative value was, he right, was like, right, well, right. I wasn't even thinking about this before, but..." And if the deal makes, and then all of a sudden those wheels yeah. are ticking, and then that's what you can start working with. Yeah. And to me, like you're helping him shop through. Yeah. Because I think people close on logic. Yeah. I believe people close logically. They buy emotionally. 100%. But, but 100%. there's got to be logic. Yeah. There's got to be something to support my emotions. Listen, something I, I'd say to Particularly everybody. Particularly with people with that kind of money. Yeah. Because they didn't get there by being just emotional. No, of course not. They all work incredibly hard. And what I tell yeah. people all the time is I cannot negotiate with someone's wallet but mm-hmm. I can negotiate with their feelings, mm-hmm. right? So I, people buy with that heart. Uh-huh. Like they, <clears throat> like I knew that he had money. Yeah. He could afford something, whether he yeah. wanted to spend it or not. Right. But I'm not gonna show a $20 million place to a guy that has a million bucks in the bank. So I'm not gonna waste my time. Like I can't negotiate with how much money he makes. Right, I can't right, negotiate right. with what he that. can get approved for, but I can negotiate with the fact that he's gonna fall in love with this place because it's gonna make him feel like a better person. Mm-hmm. And that's gonna be good for his life. It's not me doing anything else other than saying, with this home or with this product, you're gonna wake up feeling better. You might be freaked out for a moment, but yeah, you're gonna yeah, wake up yeah. feeling better. You're gonna be more excited. You're gonna work harder to work for it because I do the same thing. Like I just bought a house that scared the shit out of me. Yeah, how much? Eight. Eight million. Yeah, for yeah. my own house, right? With my wife and we're gonna renovate it and we're gonna be in it for 10 million bucks and I'm 34 and I was a hand that's model 10 amazing, years ago. Dude. Congratulations. Right. Thanks. You know, and so, 34 years old. But that's, I did that for myself yeah. because it freaked me out. Yeah. And I wanted it because now I'm going to work harder. Like yeah, you, year, finan- you financed it. Off. You financed it? Yeah. Yeah, 30 yeah. years. You got 30 year commitment to that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll get out of it before, but you know, it's, um, you set that kind of gun to your, yeah. your head. And that's uh-huh. like, that's what Million Dollar Listing did for me, right? That more than anything was a psychological shotgun to the face that said, you better be the greatest real estate broker in the world, you better soak up all of your potential. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, the whole world is going to know you suck. Yeah, and yeah. that's there's nothing better than fear of failure to ignite that initiative taking that we all have inside of us. And I really so would you that. recommend that everybody get on TV? Yes. They, they get a TV show. Yes. You know what? Yeah, I, I, I want yeah. a TV show. Yeah, Why don't sure. I have one? You do. I'm on it right now. Oh, listen, everybody more than anything, no one under the age of 30 has a cable has cable anymore. Uh-huh. Like my vlogger right, Adam right, right here, he doesn't right. know what cable TV is, right? He called it Cabell. And so everybody can get a phone. <laughs> Everyone can get a phone, can get a small camera yeah. and can make their own TV show on yeah. YouTube. And their generation is going to watch it or the younger generation that's going to be buying things. And the fact that more people aren't doing that blows my mind. And it doesn't really matter if the show sucks, right? No, you g- grow over time. I mean, the vlog for me that we have now is not the same vlog that it was at the beginning of the year. You learn from feedback, you mm-hmm. change, you mm-hmm. adapt. And that's what's so great about doing it on your own. Uh-huh. Like you can change, like it's okay. And and what you, this show I can shoot today yeah. can get shot a little faster than million dollar listing, right? Yeah. I mean, like how, how, long, how long do you spend on nine months. a shoot? Nine months. You take nine months to make one season, yeah. Dude, that's crazy, dude. It takes a while. Well, because they follow the property, they follow the deals. Like, yeah. My vlog doesn't follow deals, so they. But how will... do you get any work done, bro? Well, because it's my actual job. It works out pretty well, yeah, and I've yeah. done it now for eight yeah, years. Yeah. So, um, you know, they, I know that I'm going to have an open house for a listing that we're actually selling, and so they show up and follow it, and then the deal dies, and they're right there, and they watch the pain and yeah. anguish. So it works. Biggest disappointment you've had on a deal? On a deal? Yeah. Do you remember a deal that just went sideways? And I remember them all, man. Yeah, I mean, they're all so painful. 
you know. I mean, the big one, though. The big one that you were counting on, dude, it was going to be like, okay, that's the one. Yeah, I would say uh, a building that I lost, a building actually that I got fired from, uh-huh. right? That was the worst one because that you was You just one. connected with a lot of people, by the yeah. way. Yeah, <laughs> like getting fired is the worst. I was on a building, it was the biggest building ever. It was 442 apartments that I had to sell, which when you're just a regular real estate agent trying to sell a handful of homes a year to all of a sudden be given an entire building, uh-huh. like that's, you start thinking about like, oh, wow, that's almost like guaranteed pay, guaranteed yeah. sales, and they will sell because you know the developer has to sell them. Yeah. The developer's not gonna just sit there with apartments and not sell them, so they will sell. And getting fired from that was uh, was the worst because all of a sudden that was like, I had this I had this nugget, this golden nugget, yeah. and they fired me and they gave it to somebody else. Um, and I'm still getting revenge for it. To what, why'd they fire you? Uh, it was a host of things. It was that I was too young, right? Uh, that was one part of it. And that's discri- I mean, yeah. you can be sued for that. Not, well, not as real estate agents. No one cares, no, man. No, right. It's part that I was young. It was part that I, that I, you know, that I wasn't supposed to, I was supposed to be there seven days a week and uh-huh. that was super hard for me. And they wanted a bigger, more experienced broker amongst uh-huh. other things. And how are you getting revenge? I go after every other building in the history of the world to try to get them to show those developers what they've missed. Yeah, and how, how much of that drives you? A lot. T- t- talk to me about that. Yeah, I, I listen, I'm, I'm driven by- I mean, revenge is a pretty like effect thing, right? Yeah, it's- okay. But I mean, I, I know I can relate to, yeah, to sure. this. Like I like to get, I like to get even yeah, it's, or ahead. It's, um, it's, you know, there's, I think we all ride this equal balance between like confidence and fear, mm-hmm. right? And like you can't be too confident or you're an asshole and you can't be too afraid, otherwise you'll never get out of bed in the morning. Mm-hmm. And so for me, it's about trying to find that, that balance on that seesaw. Like how can I be as confident as possible, but also realizing like what's at stake and what's at stake is being broke, is not having the opportunities that, that I have today and waking up every day and remembering what it was like to be broke in New York City in 2008 and never going back there ever again for the rest of my life. We, That's we, what drives me. Yeah, yeah, and, and so the the with the other brokers, like where you rank with the other brokers yeah. in the market, how, how much of that is? That's a lot too. I mean, listen, it's it's. I would be lying if I said it didn't play into it. Like our numbers are important, right? Uh-huh. I want to sell as much as possible. I want the biggest team possible so that our numbers are as big as they can. Because once you hit the top, you only have down to go, mm-hmm. right? And we were number one last year. I have no idea where we'll be this year. I hope we're at the same point, hopefully. It's been a weird year. New York City real estate is tough. There's been a massive correction in New York, which the rest of the country is gonna start to feel slowly. Like I see cracks now. Mm -hmm. Everywhere I go Mm -hmm. this year, compared to the last couple of years when it's been a seller's market insanity, I start hearing people saying, it's starting to slow down, it's weird. What's Mm -hmm. it like in New York? I'm Mm -hmm. like, in New York, the average days on market is 260. Wow. Right, over 4 million, the average days on market is 450. So. That say say that last part again. The 450 over 400 over four million dollars. Yeah, any listing over four million, which is a lot. A year and the average days on market is well over a year. Wow, you know, and that's that is is that because they're overpriced? There's not buyers there. Overpriced, and they're yeah, it's oversupply. There's more supply Mm -hmm. in the market to handle Mm -hmm. buyers for five years in New York. Wow, so it's. It's, you know, New York because, is one of those cities of all where it goes the up and then goes down. It yeah. goes up and yeah. goes down. Yeah, because yeah, of all the building. It's the building. Yeah. It's also people moving out. Taxes have played a role in it mm-hmm. as well. You know, the salt deduction has been a pain in are the they ass. Coming Everyone's to, coming are here. they coming here? <laughs> Everyone's coming here going to Texas. That's why I buy apartments here. Yeah. They're coming here going to Texas. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so are you seeing the migration? Are y'all feeling it? Yeah, of course we are. Yeah, and people are Selling just... a lot of apartments for people that have picked up and moved to Florida, picked up and moved to Austin. Listen, listen, yeah. I've been saying this. Yeah. The migration is happening, man. Yeah, it works. Well, listen, there's no other place like New York. So if you have to be no, in New York, you want right. to be in New York. You know, yeah. New York is a place where appreciation is, is bar none. You know, so you can buy, you can still buy something for a million bucks in a couple of years, it might be worth two, and you didn't have to do anything to it. It's hard to do that in other places. So what do you tell your team during these periods of oversupply, uh, buyer's market? Like, how do you keep them focused and making enough money to stay in the deal? Well, we we like volatility, like brokers, right? We're agents. So we want to make money on the way down and we want to make money on the way up. Mm-hmm. But it's, you know, in either of those markets, someone's really difficult. If it's a buyer's market, the buyer is difficult because right. they're saying, no, it's going down, it's going down. I don't want to buy today. I don't want to buy today. Right. In a seller's market, the seller's like, no, I'm not taking that low offer. Mm-hmm. I'm not even taking the asking price offer. I want higher, higher, higher. But we like the volatility because at that point, both sides are willing to do deals. Mm-hmm. So I tell the team just to stay strong, keep your head down and start dialogues. 
There's nothing worse than you can do than not start a dialogue with somebody. Mm -hmm. You should never let a person leave the room unless they've made some kind of offer, even if it's 10 bucks. Mm -hmm. Like, what would you pay for this? It's asking two million. Would you pay a million for it? Yeah. Well, yeah, but no one's ever gonna, they're not gonna take it for a million. All right, right. let me see, right? Yeah. I'll give you a counter, 1.9. All right, now we're bridging the gap all of a sudden, and they didn't even know they wanted to buy it. But because they started at 50% off and that was so ridiculous, now at least you have a conversation that you've started. So would you write write that guy and say, hey, let's put it on paper, even if it's ridiculous? You can, right? But I I think that, you know, no matter what market you're selling in, just starting that price conversation Mm -hmm. gets people psychologically motivated to actually eventually spend the money, Mm -hmm. you know? And that goes a long way. Even in markets where you have to write offers and do, you know, good faith deposits, it doesn't stop you from picking up the phone and talking to the other side or talking to the seller or talking to the buyer and saying, listen, we're thinking about writing an offer, but would this price even get us close? Mm -hmm. Where would you come to? And just having that conversation keeps people excited. You want to set expectations and get people into the game. Yeah, and the buyer sees you working for them. Yeah. Try, try and give them Other than just being somebody who's showing them things that they already saw on the internet. Yeah, yeah. Hey, look, I know when I moved to Miami, we we, we moved from LA to Miami. I knew every house in, in the market. Yeah. I knew whether it was facing north, south, east. Like, I could almost feel the breeze before I got here. And then I had somebody show me stuff. Right. And they're like, I said, have you been in that house? No. I, which, which way is it face? I don't know. Yeah. You know, is it a good deal? I don't know. Yeah, product knowledge is key. Otherwise, how, how important is it? It's super important. You like you, simply put, you have to know your shit. Otherwise, uh-huh. why would anyone buy anything from you? Right. Like your, <clears throat> as salespeople, our ability is is not just in talking to the client after about the product, but it's knowing the product. Like I always say, like you walk into an Apple store and you like talking to all of those people there because they know everything yeah. about that damn yeah. phone. The genius. Yeah, yeah, right? Would you go into a gym and pick a personal trainer that's super out of weight, huffing and puffing? I've seen people do it. Yeah, like you can. <laughs> yeah. Or you yeah. can go with the person who looks like they know what they're doing because right. they take care of themselves. And you'd say, well, that guy clearly knows what he's doing or that girl knows what she's doing. So I want to work out with them because they're going to be the best use of my hard-earned mm-hmm. money. Same thing for salespeople. So you you talk about appearance, okay? I like that because you came in dressed today, you know? Sure. In, in a time where t-shirts, like when somebody makes it now, it seems yeah. like the thing they do is they go to t-shirts. Yeah, I haven't. I guess I haven't made it yet. I don't know. Yeah, but you came in dressed. I really respect that, by the way. No and, problem. And, and so how, how important is appearance? Listen, you, my appearance has nothing to do with me. Mm-hmm. I'm not wearing a suit and tie because of me. I'm doing it for you. And I'm doing it for my clients. You like, shouldn't have. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> right? I do it honestly. It's out of respect for the person in front of me uh, because interesting. I, at the end of the day, I'm just a salesperson. Yeah. Like I'm bringing a service to other people, uh-huh. so it's a show of respect uh-huh. that you wake up and you dress nicely for somebody else. Mm-hmm. I, you may think you're the shit because you can wear a t-shirt and show up, and if that works for you, like who am I to say that yeah. it shouldn't work for you? Right. But it's also kind of a sign of disrespect that you don't care enough to fucking iron your shirt yeah yeah you know like that stuff just pisses me off i don't know maybe it's old school but at the end of the day well you're not old enough to be old school yeah how old are you uh, 34 yeah so you can't even use the old school thing yeah but at the end of the day like it's like you first impressions are everything for me and if you are not careful your first impression is also your last what do you do when the first impression is not good i'm sure you've had something where you, you know particularly in the tv space yeah right Try to fix it. <laughs> but so you can, right? You, you can. Have you turned around bad first impressions? Of myself? No, of uh, others <laughs> to you. Oh, I, uh, I, sure. I mean, yeah. Because I always you, got confused yeah. about the first impression thing because I'm like, does that mean that like I'm out now because yeah. I didn't make a good first impression because most of the time I don't? I think I, I try to. <laughs> <laughs> I think I try to apologize when I when I know that I've made a bad uh-huh. first impression, uh-huh. or at least try to show that that I've you know I, I am worth something. Like I have someone of value, and this is what I can provide to you. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, a lot of times you don't know that you've given a bad first impression. Like you don't know. Yeah. You know, unless someone says it to your face, you just never hear from that person ever again. You don't know why. Mm-hmm. It's probably because you had a bad first impression, yeah. and then it became your last impression. <laughs> right. Right. Like, and that sucks. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. I know that when I make like. Oh, he doesn't like me. Or maybe I'm just being sensitive and they do like me, but, I, you know. Yeah, maybe. So how, are you sensitive? Are you a sensitive? Probably. I think so. I'm a yeah. cancer. I was born in July. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I want everyone to like me just like everybody else. Yeah. You right. want them to like you or buy from me? Both. Yeah. Yeah, both. But listen, if they don't buy from me now, but they like me, yeah. they will yeah. buy from me or refer me sometime in the future, yeah. and I'm not going anywhere. So last thing, and I want to talk about the book and where people can get it. It's on Amazon, I'm sure. Yeah, it's everywhere. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's everywhere. Everywhere books can be, I think. Yeah. It's right here in Miami right now. Yeah. Um, where do you want people to go to get it? 
Amazon or you can go to, to Amazon, you? Barnes and Noble, find it on sellexterhand.com, Audible, ebooks, like it's everywhere. Did you Amazon, read the book? Did you read it yourself? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Dude, the, what do you mean, of course? <laughs> what, most it? people don't read really? it. Really? No, most people have somebody else read it. Yeah, that's unfortunate. No, it's terrible. Yeah, I mean, it's my whole life. Like, it's everything yeah. that I've ever known about selling and how to structure your day, like little stuff that I haven't found on my own about like what, you know, what to do when you wake up, you know, how to, how to really be your own boss, mm -hmm. how to be your own CFO, your own COO, like all the little minutia down to the, the bigger picture too. And it's funny. Yeah. Like it's, my life has been a series so of how, how funny, do you, unfortunate events. How, how do, it seems like it's pretty fortunate, man. We're meeting, we're spending time together, you know? Yeah, now. So, so how, um, how do you start your day? I get to ask this question all the time. I don't know why people are so hung up on this big question. Yeah. Uh, how Monday through Friday, start? I wake up, depending on the day, I wake up between 4.30 and 5. Okay. Um, I answer emails from the night before or I fire off emails that are going to start the day. That way, when people wake up an hour, two hours later, they already know that I beat them. Mm -hmm. Right. That's mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I go to the gym and I work out for an hour, hour 15, come back, shower, say goodbye to my wife head off to appointments for my entire day, do a dinner event or two or something that I have that night, come home, hang out with my wife a little bit, answer emails, clean up the day, prep for the day ahead because your day ahead always starts the night before, pass out, wake up, start all over again. How many hours a day? Well, how many hours is that? No, I mean, it depends on what you call work. Like my yeah. whole day is work. Like, yeah. so 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. So you never turn it off. Not really, no. no but you, I also dude. like, I, you're in good company. I'm not right sitting now. in the office. Yeah, you know? yeah, I understand. I'm all over the place. So that work life balance for me is is all the time because there's synergy to it. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I talk to my wife all day long, I FaceTime her all day. She comes to as many events with me as possible and she's great for my business. Yeah. Like, people like me more because they know that she can handle me. Yeah, she, now, and how important is it uh, having having somebody on the same page with you? Super important. She knows what I'm going through, yeah. you know, and she, what, she what understands. What does she do? Uh, she's a lawyer. Okay. Yeah, so she understands and she gets it and she can help me reason things through when I'm being irrational and crazy mm -hmm. and sensitive, right? And she can say, let's take a step back and really think about this, so that's helpful. Um, and so she's been great. She's been good for me personally and for business, obviously. And and she is she pushing you to say, hey, let's go do some more, let's do bigger things? Kind of. I think she would say she does. For me, she she keeps me even keeled, you know, mm -hmm. as much as I can be anyway. The book, sell it like Sir Hant. You guys know how much I like sales, okay? Like you're not going to go any place without it. If you weren't selling real estate, what would you be selling? Oh, I don't know. I would probably still be uh, playing a clock in some off off Broadway performance, you know, making two bucks a week. It'd be great. It, it, why, why didn't you do the hedge fund thing? Why didn't, why didn't you go into your dad's space? I didn't like it. Huh? I didn't, I didn't, it wasn't for me and I, I, I wasn't smart enough. Yeah, like, well, it God. just wasn't my thing. If it, uh, that that's what I would do when I come back, I'm coming back is either hedge fund guy or yeah. a, a rapper. One yeah, of the those two. guys are. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. There's those options. Maybe both. Yeah, yeah maybe. Maybe both. by that time I could do hedge fund and rap. Yeah, the portfolio you know? manager rapper. That would be great. Last piece of advice, Ryan, you would give anybody out there thinking about getting in real estate or sales or trying to take their life to the next level. My best piece of advice would be just to do it. Right. I would rather regret the things I did than the things I never tried. There's so many people I meet who got their license five years ago and still haven't done it, who haven't left the job that they hate, who are still working part time somewhere else because they're too nervous. Like you only have one life to live. And before you know it, we will be dead. So just uh -huh. get off your ass and do it. Do you think, do, how do you know that's true, by the way? I, because it's you dude, only live 10 once. years ago, I was, oh, I mean, metaphysically, dude, I don't know. I think there is some sort of. Why did everybody say that? Everybody says this like they're so confident you only live once. I'm like, how do you know that? As far as I know, I only live once and that's how I'm going to live my life now. If it, trues, if it comes out not to yeah. be true, yeah. I'll come and find you and be like, dude, this life, I'm taking it easy because I got another one coming. But as for right now, I'm living this one like it's my last. See, see I push harder because I think maybe I do come back. Uh oh, as a rapper. Or a hedge fund guy. <laughs> there you go. Or you're buddy. awesome, dude. Thanks Appreciate you coming me. in. Okay. Hey, guys, grab the book. Okay. Now, if you're not in real estate, would the book still help you? Yeah. It's, you know, uh, I did a show on Bravo as well that you can watch called Sell It Like Sir Hand, where I went in and I helped other salespeople who don't do real estate learn how to sell whatever they sell from cabinets to hot tubs, insurance, mm -hmm. body waxing memberships. And so the book is for how to sell anything. It's not just real yeah, estate. Yeah, so I, and this is really important for you guys out there. This guy's selling $31 million projects. If you can figure out how to sell 31 million, 80 million, 100 million, guarantee you, guarantee you, you can transition to a hot tub. Yes. Okay, and true. you should work on and selling other so. things, not just the thing you're having trouble with, okay? Yeah, Thanks a lot for being here, man. I know it's gonna help a lot of people. Hey, get yourself in a position to sit in that chair right there, dress like this, dude. He's got all his, 
He's got all the bands going. He's looking yeah, New, York. New York. He's looking fresh. He's looking good. And he's creating success and sharing that great example. You need to do the same thing. Thank you for watching Power Players. See you next time. Automatons, or artificial beings capable of independent thought, have been a fixture of science fiction, literature, and motion pictures throughout time. Today, the convergence of technology and imagination has reached new heights, which are reflected in the advancements that we see in every area of our lives. Over the last couple of years, AI machines have made their way into our homes, the battlefield, our workplace, and even into our hands in the form of smartphones with voice recognition. Digital assistants for the home represent an opportunity if you know how to take advantage of them. That is where Nico's Computer Engineering comes in. Tim Clark brings you the latest news about the most up-to-date strategies to position yourself in the digital landscape, finding a path to productive business applications and how to automate them with artificial intelligence are just a few of the topics we cover in our weekly segments. Nico's Computer Engineering is here to find a unique solution for you. Growing your future, protecting your past, J.D. Frost & Company, PLLC, is a public accounting firm, offers a variety of assurance and tax services to businesses and individuals in the Chattanooga and surrounding areas. We focus on construction and manufacturing industries. Our primary objective is client satisfaction through excellent customer service. Work with the best. We are accredited by the BBB. This is JD Frost and Company for a full suite of tax assurance and management accounting services. Visit us right now at frostcpas.com. MailTag is an email tool that helps you make more sales in less time. Imagine sending out an important email and knowing if and when it was opened. Imagine it was a proposal or your resume. 78% of people you are sending email content to never read it. Unlimited real-time tracking, email scheduling, pings, and trusted by 13,000 plus professionals worldwide. Start your 14-day free trial with MailTag. Chasing low-quality leads and leaving voicemails for prospects is no way to grow a business. We both know that. What would 50, 100, or even 200 new customers contacting you directly every month mean for your bottom line? If you're a contractor, then we can help you fill your pipeline and start today. At Chrome Leads, we help you fill your schedule with solid appointments. Get more leads, write more estimates, and close more deals. Need funding to scale your business? We've got you covered. Chrome Leads is here to help you to build your business brick by brick. Call us today at 403-710-6271. That's 403-710-6271. Or visit us at chromeleads.com today. The more comfortable you get with yourself, the less scary it is for people to actually see you. We all know as parents that there's nothing more powerful than a mother's love. And how can I be that extraordinary parent for my kids? And how kind we are to each other. The more that you love you, the less you care if others love you. The idea is to really just choose to be with yourself. The challenges and the struggles and the frustrations and the self-doubt and insecurities can often keep us from living. We can master our lives from the inside out. Chris Rude of Hustle Wholesaling. Chris is in the uh, interesting uh, real estate space, but he's figured out a little niche of it, flipping deals, what he calls hotailing and wholesaling. I want to show you how to get into real estate without making all the mistakes I have. He actually doesn't own the real estate. What he does is he buys a contract. He basically, you don't actually buy the contract, you control the contract. Correct. Visit chrisrude.com to book a call right now. 
Hey, are you looking to invest in real estate? My name's Grant Cardone. I'm the founder of Cardone Capital. And for the past 30 years, I've been making money with my first business, taking that money and putting it into my second business, real estate. If you're anything like me, the hardest part was making the money. The second hardest part was, where do I invest it now that I have some? When I looked around, my only options were stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, and I hated all three of them because I'm a coward. And that's why I started investing in income producing properties. Today, we own almost 5,000 units around the United States that produce positive cash flow every single month. Today, qualified investors can now invest with us at Cardone Capital, where we give you access to institutional sized deals. These are monster sized deals that can weather time. Look, if you love real estate, if you're a qualified investor and you love real estate, but you don't have the time, you can't find the deals and you don't have the know-how, Go to CardoneCapital.com. I would love to partner with you on my next deal.